Lord David Frost, it's a pleasure to have you back again. And we've got a few more questions for you following on from the last interview. We want to start with something that is pretty important to an awful lot of people out there, which is net zero and the cost of net zero to ordinary people. So can you give us your view on current policies? Set aside the question of the science and global warming uh, in, in a sort of scientific sense. There obviously is warming going on. What I'm not persuaded of is this belief that we're in some sort of climate crisis, catastrophe, the planet is burning. That just doesn't seem to me to be justified by the evidence. So you know, global warming is an issue. It's an issue that needs to be dealt with like any other pragmatically and in a rational fashion. And that's the problem that I think we we have. We've chosen a way of dealing with net zero across the West, which is a kind of high high cost, high tax, um, socialist, socialized government direction way of doing it. We've chosen this irrational route of wind power and solar power renewables on the grid that just push up costs are not reliable don't deliver power when we when we need it uh, and we're neglecting things that we know can deal with the problem if you want to have net zero then we know how to do it you should build lots of modern gas power gas power stations and you should um, build some new nuclear power stations and that, that delivers net zero you don't need to get into this um whole pan panoply of uh, offshore, onshore wind farms, defective renewables, and worst of all, all the sort of lifestyle controls, uh, you know, kind of cost variation of power, the, the restrictions on life in terms of travel, where, you know, where you live, how you heat your house, all this sort of thing. We just should not be doing any of that. In a modern society, the job of the government is to ensure that there is enough dispatchable power for everybody at a reasonable price uh, in for a modern advanced industrial society. And I just fear we're not doing that. We're pushing up the costs. We're driving business out of Britain to countries who have different sets of priorities, and it's all going to end in tears. And I think people are just beginning to realise that. We're, we're just seeing the debate start to swing. And I really hope that continues. And it's really important that we keep pushing at it, in my view. Immigration is a huge issue for the public, even if it isn't for the Westminster bubble. Do you think that the Rwanda scheme has any chance of working now that it's finally the bill has been passed? And if not, what other measures should be undertaken to stop the votes? I think it's got a chance of working. I, I'm not sure I think it's a very high chance, but uh, let's see now how things play out. I, I think what we should have done is what um, some of us advocated back in December, January, which is a more robust bill, which completely excludes jurisprudence from the ECHR, uh, from UN conventions in this area, um, excludes uh to an even greater extent domestic challenge to removals and made it absolutely clear that the scheme could be delivered and that um with great certainty that if you turn up in a small boat on the south coast then you had a good chance of ending up in rwanda and maybe other countries if we can agree such schemes now, the problem is I don't think we've excluded these challenges sufficiently, and I, I worry we're going to get bogged down in you know further round of legal processes. The deterrent is not going to work well enough. And, of course, everybody can see that there's an election coming which the Conservative Party might well lose, and the opposition has said it will scrap the scheme. So that in itself is another problem that, that, that weakens the deterrent. So... I don't think the government has given itself the best possible chance. And obviously, it's taken far too long to get to, to this point, two years of legislation. Um, but I, I think 
you know, there are obviously other things we we should be doing, and part of that is kind of cooperating upstream with the the Europeans who have their own version of this this problem. Um, but you've got to have a proper deterrent at the heart of it, and you know we, we've got to make that work. We've got to make our own asylum processing system work. We should be much more rigorous about refusing asylum to people who are gaming the system and putting them on planes back home. So none of these things are a silver bullet, but at the core of it, you've got to have the deterrence. And I'm, I'm not convinced we're going to get the deterrence right. I mean, I hope I'm wrong because it's really important, but uh, I'm not sure. And when it comes to legal migration, what are your, your views? What would you do? We had over 700,000 net coming into the country last year. What are your views about what should be done to tackle legal migration? It's too high. I mean, that is obviously too high. And people keep voting for parties who say they'll bring the numbers down, and they just don't. And it was in our manifesto in 2019 that we would bring the numbers down, and we, we just haven't. And I think there are two reasons for that. One is the... um the economic departments within the government believe that immigration is an unalloyed good. They don't look at the costs over time as well as the benefits. They look at the overall size of the economy. They don't look at GDP per head, which is actually falling now and has been for, for two years. So I think the economics are, are wrong on this. I think to be fair to the Boris Johnson government, um, Obviously, we, we left the EU's immigration scheme in 19, 2019, 2020. It coincided with the pandemic, you know, massive economic shock. Nobody quite knew how that was going to, to play out. And we have a lot of information now that we didn't have then. We just didn't know whether large numbers of people were going to leave and not come back, how possible it was going to be to move across borders in future. And although it wasn't my area, I think one of the things that happened was erring a bit on the side of generosity and caution in case the shock turned out to be much greater than it, than it would have been. Um, but as soon as, as it was clear things were going back to normal, we should have made the rules much more restrictive. And we just haven't. And that must be done. Just coming back to the challenges that you mentioned that you fear may, may come up from the Rwanda bill, Direct question, should the U UK leave the ECHR? I think I have changed my mind over this, I must say. If you'd asked me in 2019, I would have said probably not. I don't think it's necessary. I, unfortunately, I do think it's necessary now. I think events have shown that you can't... We, we're not going to be able to control our border rules we're not going to be able to control lots of other things as well. While we're caught up in this web of ECHR jurisprudence, the activist court and its decision on climate change the other day is another sort of straw in the wind of the way this is going. Now, I, I think you have to be clever about it. I don't think it's possible just to kind of snap your fingers and leave. Um, I think the best way thing to have done would have been just to override bits of it in the Rwanda bill and bring it back home in domestic law. So we had the control in that area. We do have to you know, sort a way through on the Northern Ireland issue, where the ECHR is part of the, 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 the kind of political deal. None of that is, is insuperable to a government that has will and determination to do it. Um, and I think it should be in the manifesto. And I think we should set out a plan if we were elected to to make that happen. But I, I think it is, it, it, in fairness, I think it is true to say, you know, it is a complex task. It's not as complex as leaving the EU, but you have to plan it. You have to bring people along with you. Otherwise, it doesn't work. I'm not a politician, so I'm summarising your point of view as pretty much, yes, we are going to have to either leave the ECHR or certainly leave parts of it. Would that be a, a reasonable summary? Yes, or just override it in our own law, as we've tried to do in different areas.
there are different ways of doing this. 